Now joining me, 1986 Mets backup catcher number 49, Ed Hearn. Ed has a charity, Bottom of the Ninth. You can find out more information by visiting www.edhearn.com. And we'll get to the charity stuff in the website in just a little bit. But Ed, first off, Zach Gell, PureShovio.com. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing this evening? Doing great, man. Just dodging some tornadoes out here in Kansas. Well, how are you, how are you? Are you okay? Is everything good with your house and everything in Kansas with the tornadoes? Yeah, the tornadoes are doing alright. I have been able to dodge them. I can still move around a little bit, but uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm on my ninth year with my third kidney transplant, uh, so that's been functioning quite well. And uh, you, know, you know, I've been through a little bit over the years, and was having had three transplants and several other health conditions. But you know, um, I've had a had a great opportunity over the last 15 years uh, after losing my health to make a feel like I've it's all been for a purpose, man, to, to be able to positively impact people's lives through my story from the penthouse to the outhouse and back. Well, best of luck to you, and we'll get to your charity in just a little bit. But one thing I was always fascinated about, and I wasn't alive for the 86 World Series, but the Let's Go Mets video, uh, tell me about your experience with that. How fun of a day was that? Oh, super. You know, uh, we, had, we had some uh, great characters on that team, as you probably are up to speed on, and... Uh, you know, we we did a lot of fun things, and uh, they just have to catch a couple of me, uh, uh, you know, doing some of those things. But you know, we did a lot of that stuff back then, and uh, I think uh, you know, being able to play the game loose and and uh, you know, not taking like every night like it's the you know end of the world if you take a loss. So uh, you know, we we kept ourselves loose by having having a lot of fun and uh, a lot of practical jokes happened on that team. Now let's go to the New York Mets of today. We'll get back to the 86 Mets in just a bit. Fred Wolpon, he's in a bunch of financial uh, troubles uh, with the whole mess with Bernie Madoff. Um, he's not the happiest man these days, but he goes out there, rips David Wright, rips Carlos Beltran, and rips Jose Reyes. What's your reaction to the owner's controversial comments? You know, I, I, it's, it's very difficult for me to, to have a real perspective on what's happening there. Uh, you know, all the stuff with Madoff, you know, I mean, uh, who, who, who am I to pass judgment on that sort of thing. Uh, you know, as far as the, the relationship with the players and stuff, you know, that's got to be tough. I mean, certainly it's got to be frustrating. It's been 25 years since the Mets won a World Series. And, you know, I think, you know, there's frustration in everybody's part. It, but I think there's additional pressure there because it's New York, because they're one of the higher payrolls. And, you know, it's, you know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And so that pressure is felt by the players and, and by ownership. I mean, uh, so, you know, when you're feeling that kind of stress, um, you know, uh, sparks are going to fly, and that's that's what's happening right now. Now, during your career, you were labeled as a journeyman. You played in Philadelphia before you got cut. Then you had the great one-year run with the New York Mets winning a World Series. And then you were traded in part with the David Cohn trade to go to Kansas City. And this year's Mets teams, it's uh, a bunch of different kinds of guys and a lot of journeymen coming up from Buffalo, from other teams. What would your advice be to these kinds of players like Justin Turner, who may not even be here in a month, A, because of the financial situation, and B, because, you know what, the facts are he's a minor league ball player, doesn't have a lot of big league experience, so what would your advice be to these journeyman players in this year's New York Mets? Uh, I, I say don't let labels and people, uh, media, and anybody like Ed Earn tell you you can't do the job. You know what? There's guys that get labeled. I was labeled as a, a, a defensive catcher and all this stuff, and as far as I was concerned, I was more comfortable as a hitter than being a catcher. So those labels when and, and what people say and tag you with, that, that's absolutely meaningless. You go out there and you play the game as hard as you can. And I believe that when, you, when, when the future comes and you, you look yourself in the mirror, you don't want to ever have to look in that mirror and say, if only I had done this or if only I had done that. And that's my advice to, to so many people in life, too. I mean, you got to go for it. And you just don't want to look back with regret. So that's what I would say to those guys. Don't listen to don't, have to, don't take with a grain of salt what, what people are saying or what you're labeled as this or that. You know, a lot of great players have been labeled just uh, journeymen or, you know, earlier in their careers. And, you know, they've had great careers. But anybody who's playing the big leagues, they could, they have ability and, and they can play the game of baseball. We're talking to former New York Mets catcher Ed Hearn. And, Ed, on May 17th, you debuted with this New York Mets team. What do you remember going into that clubhouse, especially with the notoriety that that group had with the New York Mets? Uh, they were a fun group, to say the least. But uh, what do you remember? Were you intimidated at all going into the clubhouse as a rookie? No, I mean, I, I felt like, you know, for the last two or three years prior to that, I've been part of spring training and uh, it, it almost made the club there two years in a row. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I think... Uh, 
I mean, I fit in good. I mean, I, I felt like, uh, you know, it was all about contributing to what we were trying to do. And, uh, you know, like in August when, when Gary went down for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, the headlines the next day. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying about the journeyman, the tag. You know, the headlines in the, in the big papers was worst thing that could happen to the Mets. Carter goes down. Well, the next two weeks we go like 11 and 2 or something while he's out. And, and our teammates and the other our guys are going, hey, kid, won't you take a few more days off, man? <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, it's a uh, it great, great time, man. Just enjoyed it. And uh, unfortunately, things didn't work out with the injury after I came to Kansas City. But uh, you know what? Uh, you, you can't control things you can't control. You just got to go forward you can. Being in that locker room, being in that clubhouse, knowing all the things that went on, if this team didn't have so many extracurricular, off-the-field problems and they had an abundance of problems off the field, do you believe that this New York Mets team would have been labeled a dynasty if they didn't get involved with all the cocaine that we've heard that players did on that team? Well, absolutely. When I got the call that I was being traded, or that I had been traded with five or six days left in the spring of 87, that was the absolute first thing on my mind was, you know, I could be leaving here and leaving two, three, four rings behind, you know, if I had able, been able to stay and play in New York and been a part of that group. But, you know, uh, I speak around the country to, to corporations, associations, and, you know, people want to hear about teamwork, working together, and I say, well, you all got to be committed to the same goal, and you got to be willing to make the sacrifices to to keep your nose clean and keep the, the goal in focus. And, you know, you get involved, you get too cocky, and you know what? That's the beginning of the decline. You look at the greatest civilizations in the world. It was a history of, of time, and they've all fallen. Once they've got too cocky, they start getting greedy and think about themselves and get lustful and all these other uh, sinful types of nature. So, you know, uh, uh, it's been 25 years, and that's a long time. But I think back then in those those five or six years, I think what you, exactly what you're talking about is... is uh, Duly noted, and I agree wholeheartedly. Now, one of those players which were unbelievable, and I mean, I've never seen a pitcher watching all that highlights than Doc Gooden throwing fastballs. His pitching, his pitches were just unbelievable, but he did have a ton of off-the-field problems. What was the feel at the stadium like when you were catching on a day when they gave Carter the day off and you were catching Doc Gooden? It was wonderful. You know, I, I had caught Doc in 1983 in Lynchburg, Virginia, and Doc was, you know, Doc was... Doc was Doc. He just I described him great. And it was always, it was just always, there was electricity in the air. The fans were just lit up, and they started hanging the K signs, and all that stuff started happening back then. So it was, it was an added jolt of uh, uh, juice in the air with, with Doc on the hill. Uh, but, you know, uh, Doc is a great kid. He, he was a great kid. He's got a big heart. And, uh, you know, I, I, I use him as an example when I'm speaking to to young people, you know, you can be a good kid, you can have a great heart, but if you're not, a, if you're not willing to stand up to the peer pressure that will come, then you can succumb to to the things that Doc succumbed to. It, Doc didn't get in trouble because he was a bad guy or an evil dude. He he just was was unable to say no to the guys back home, and that was, that began the ball rolling. And once we slide start down that slippery hill, uh, it's it's tough to turn it around, especially when you may not have. Uh, good role models on your on your ball club. We're talking to Ed Hearn. You can visit his charity, Bottom of the Ninth, at www.edhearn.com. We'll get to the charity in just a little bit. But let's take you back to Game 6. Uh, there's tons of stories of players not watching that uh, play of Mookie Wilson. They thought the season was over. They thought the run was over. Uh, where were you for the Mookie Wilson play? I was on the spot. I wouldn't move, man. We started making make a comeback there, uh, you know, us ball players are really superstitious, and, uh, you know, you move around when things aren't good, go, going well, you change up here and there, but uh, I was down on the top uh, the top plank of wood on the on the edge of the, the dugout there, on down by the camera bay, and uh, man, I, I didn't even want to get up and move when, when we scored a run. I didn't want to go down and high-five guys. I was, I was so locked in on, on that superstition. Man, I found the hot spot. I can't move now. But it was fabulous to watch that happen. Uh, one of my biggest memories is from that angle where I was sitting, I could see the fans behind home plate and uh, the Red Sox fans on the visiting side and the Mets fans closer to us. And, you know, it was just a, the, the contrast was unbelievable. The Red Sox, you know, wives and families were just, you know, they were just partying. They were ready to, I mean, they, they had it in the bag. And uh, the Mets people were just hanging their heads and, 
their faces were in their hands, and, and all of a sudden, two, three, four hitters later, it's just totally switched, and boom, it's all over. And, uh, you know, I tell you, uh, actually, I think the Red Sox were really lucky that uh, we got rained out the next day because there was no way that they would beat us if we played that next night. As it, as it turned out in Game 7, of course, we were behind and had to come from, from behind once again, but the momentum was unbelievable. When you're playing at Shea and you got the momentum going, it's great. But on the other hand, like you said, when you mentioned Will Pond and the current players, when things aren't going well, it can be just as multiplied, and it can be that much more difficult. Does Mookie beat out the play if Bill Buckner fields that uh, ball cleanly? You know, I, I tell you, it's, it's toss-up. I, I, you know, uh, I... I Nobody, nobody knows, uh, but I definitely think it's going to be a really close play, and I think he's got at least a 50-50 chance. Uh, you know, the thing that Bill didn't do is he didn't charge that ball. You know, if he had just taken three or four steps forward, he'd have caught the ball on a nice big soft top, but he, he was kind of playing it safe, and he played back, and, and that ball on that last final bounce just it stayed down, and uh, he was expecting to come up and roll right, right under the glove. You know, that... Uh, he just wasn't aggressive in, in that situation. He, you know, he's, he's made so many great plays. He's a great hitter throughout his career, and uh, you know, fortunately now he's 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 uh, you know he's doing some things for Mookie. He's going back to Boston, and, and you know, most people have gotten over that. So that's I'm happy for him in that regard. Now, in Game Six, was the stadium louder then when that play happened with Bill Buckner, or which was louder in Game Six when that play happened with Bill Buckner, or in Game Seven when Jesse Orozco throws his glove up in the air? What 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 part was louder for you as a player absorbing it all in? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell you how loud it was when uh, when, uh, when when we won the whole thing, uh, but I know that uh, I, I don't think it could have been any louder than when things turned around there in Game Six. Uh, but in all actuality, the loudest point in the postseason was uh, in uh, in Houston when we were facing the possibility of facing Mike Scott in the, a third time, and uh, he had us absolutely baffled. When you're in that dome there, uh, that those fans were rocking, and they knew that if they could get, get us to, to Mike Scott for that final game of the series, that they had a heck of a chance of beating us right there, and that was unbelievably loud. Now, Ed, something that fascinates me as we're talking to Ed Hearn was I heard Doc Gooden on with Boomer and Carden in WFAN in New York uh, yesterday, and he said he wasn't at the parade. He was doing lines of cocaine out on Long Island. Were you cognizant of that? Did you realize that, hey, Doc Gooden, the star pitcher of the 1986 New York Mets, wasn't at the World Series parade? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, you know, and, and the, you know, you feel for the guy, man. I mean, to me, that uh, one of my biggest memories was the ride from Shea Stadium down to the lower uh, Manhattan uh, business district there in Battery Park where we started the parade. All of the all the roads were blocked off by barricades and police and all the fans were on top of the hoods of their car, construction workers hanging out over 15 stories up just, and everybody was pumping their hands in that let's go Mets rhythm. Let's go Mets. And you know, to note to, to the realization that a guy like Doc he wasn't there. We didn't. We didn't know for sure what was going on. But you know that he probably, you know, did something the night before that just laid him out and couldn't make it back. And uh, that's a sad thing. But you know, when when you when you um, when you when you make mistakes in life, you got to pay the, the consequences. And uh, you know, missing out on that parade, I think, is something he'll always regret. Uh, but you know, uh, hopefully, you know, I mean, I talked to Doc, and you know. He's just when he thinks he's got it cleaned up, he he, he bounces back a little mischief, you know. So, uh, but but that's that's a consequence of when you screw up, you're gonna have to pay it. Unfortunate news with your friend Gary Carter. Can you give us a few words on the kid? Yeah, you know uh, Gary. Gary's a uh, uh, my son is named Cody Carter Earn, and he's named Carter after Gary. And uh, you know that's. Uh, you know, anytime anybody's dealing with health issues of that potential magnitude, it's uh, uh, you know certainly our, our we're concerned and our prayers and thoughts are with him. But uh, you know, Gary was Gary was a uh, Gary was an important fellow in my career. Uh, he was uh, he was a good mentor and a good role model. And uh, you know, it's tough when uh, good guys got to fight these kind of fights. But uh, that's part of life. And uh, you know, Gary knows that not he's a man of faith and. And, uh, I, you know, regardless of what the outcome is, I know where he's going to end up in eternity. So that's a bonus. 
We're talking about completely two different body parts, but you went through a ton of surgeries, as you mentioned, nine surgeries. Did you get a chance to talk to your good friend Gary Carter yet? I haven't talked to him here since the announcement. Uh, you know, I I don't know. That was just my makeup. He was a player, you know, a guy hit a home runner, bagel, and high-fiving and grabbing around a guy and all that. You know, I, I was kind of a backdoor leader kind of guy uh, where, you know, five minutes later, guy sit down, he's wiped himself, towed off, and go pump him in the arm, go, that a boy, way to go. And I think it's the same way it is, uh, you know, when, when guys are hurt and whatever, you know, uh, everybody everybody gets up and his phone's jammed and emails and all that. And, you know, when things go along, uh, you know, I'll get in touch with him, man, and, and uh, you know, I'll be there for him. He knows we're there for him, man. There's just no doubt about that. We're talking to Ed Hearn, and Ed, tell me a little bit more about edhearn.com in the bottom of the ninth. Uh, the bottom of the ninth is just a nonprofit dedicated to to character development. Uh, you know, our country. I think uh, it's it's hard not to notice that the slide that our country's been on the last twenty, thirty years, and it's uh, you know we're we're struggling in this glo- global uh, globalization because of the character. Uh, the, the, the greed, the lust, the I, I, me, me attitudes, and I think it all comes out of a matter of character. And so I started the bottom of the ninth because bottom of the ninth doesn't have to list home teams. Good guys are tired of behind. And right now, I believe our country, we're, we need to make a character comeback. And so we do a lot of work with kids and, and adults in different programs to try to help them focus on things that are really, truly important and, and not the things that so many people are getting caught up in today's society. Ed, it's a great uh, charity, no doubt about it. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you giving us some of your time. My pleasure, man. Great interview. You guys keep swinging. Thank you.